This is the Voice of Freedom. to the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. to the Hour of the Time, I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, today you're going to hear a broadcast that was originally aired on June the 25th, 1993. It is an interview that I conducted with Travis Walton in a small park in a small town in uh, East Central Arizona called Snowflake, where Travis Walton lives. And, uh, what you're going to hear is incredible in ways. You're also going to hear the first shifting of a story that was told on the night of the occurrence by those involved who were with Travis Walton when he was supposedly abducted by an extraterrestrial spacecraft none of whom said that at the time. And five days later, when Travis Walton began to tell his story, initially, no one saw a spacecraft of any kind. No one saw a flying disc or disc-shaped object or craft at all. What they saw and what they told the police and the sheriff's department and others who interviewed them was that they saw a very bright light in the woods that appeared to be hovering in or just above the trees, back in the trees, not right at the side of the road. No one saw what the light was or what the light was attached to, ladies and gentlemen. None of them ventured an explanation as to what it was. But then they began to conjecture, and others began to conjecture that it may have been an UFO and that Travis Walton might have been abducted. And since then, the story has escalated. Listen to the story as Travis Walton tells it to me in this park in his own words. This broadcast and this interview has not been changed in any way. It has not been edited at all. And the only thing that you're not going to hear is the traditional hour of the time lead-in music and the traditional sign-off and lead out music. 
And you're going to hear the broadcast exactly as it was aired on June the 25th, 1993. You will clearly hear the beginning of some fabrication. But you're also going to hear him tell you that he didn't know what it was, that he never saw any alien or extraterrestrial beings, that he really didn't know what happened to him. The only time that he said that he regained any consciousness during that entire five days was just for a few moments when he felt as if he was suffocating. He was in a full-blown hysterical panic during which sort of episode one is likely to see anything, ladies and gentlemen. And he describes seeing some kind of humanoid creatures. He doesn't know what they were. He does not say that they were aliens or extraterrestrial, nor does he imply that they are. And then listen to his testimony now. Just recently, he was on an episode of Sightings, where not only did he come to, but he looked around and saw extraterrestrial beings, walked down hallways, and did things on what he identified as a spaceship, and all kinds of elaborations. What I'm trying to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is what began as a mystery that no one knew the answer to, certainly had nothing to do with UFOs or extraterrestrial beings or anything else, has now, ex has now fully exploded into a full-blown extraterrestrial abduction spacecraft they're coming to get us experience. And so you need to be able to compare all of these things. Many investigators have copies of the original testimony given to the police and to the sheriff and to the special investigator from the state of Arizona who took the statements of all of these people in the beginning. And then later, it began to develop. And after this is over, we'll talk about what you have heard. But until you've heard it, there really isn't much to talk about. So, ladies and gentlemen, right after this, we will get right into it and let you make up your own mind about what really happened in Arizona. It's not a religious show, never was intended to be, and never will be. However, most of what is happening in the world today is caused by religious events that happened thousands of years ago, and hundreds of years ago, and some just yesterday. I'm going to tell you now our purpose, our beliefs, our creed, if you will, what we hope to accomplish can be summed up very simply. And you may quote me. Number one, I am a messenger. Make no mistake about that. My purpose and the purpose of those who help in this cause and the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence is to wake the sheeple, empower the people, save freedom for the world, understanding that freedom cannot exist without God. We believe that none of this can happen unless all the secrets are unlocked 
and all of the truth is opened and bared to the light of day. We must live our lives from a point of truth. We must not accept the deceptions and the manipulations that are aimed at us, that are meant to capture our attention and spin us around in little cul-de-sacs, that are bent upon pitting us against each other and creating great wars to decimate our populations and control us and line the pockets of those who are the controllers. We believe that secrets must end. Deception must end. Manipulation must end. We believe that all peoples must live their lives by the truth and by the truth only. And we believe that every single person upon the face of this earth must become responsible for their actions, for their countries, and for the world. We believe that racism is inherently evil and must be eradicated from the face of this earth, and this must be done quickly and completely or we will be facing a war between the races that will be the bloodiest, most destructive, most painful, most terrible war that has ever been fought in the history of the world. We believe that the Constitution of the United States of America and the first ten amendments, known as the Bill of Rights, are the only documents in the history of the world that have ever truly set man free. We believe that those documents are the only barrier existing in the world right now between the common man and slavery. And that if the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights fall for any reason, if they're destroyed, ripped apart, torn asunder, superseded, replaced, however you wish to term it, that freedom will disappear from the face of this earth understand that we don't care where you live what color you are what language you speak or what religion you attend everyone in this world will lose all freedom if those documents fall many of you in foreign countries wonder why we concentrate upon saving the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and don't address many of the issues in the rest of the world. It's because you have already fallen. You have already lost your freedoms or you never had them to begin with. Your hope lies with us. It is the only hope for the world. And if we fail, you all fail. We all fail. Humanity will take a step backwards from which it may never recover. Chew on that for a while, folks. Tonight we're going to take you into the mind, into the experience of a man named Travis Walton. You may have heard of him. You may have seen the major motion picture that is making the rounds right now about his experience called Fire in the Sky. Pay close attention. This is a story that you don't want to miss. It is one that is happening all over this country and around the world to many people. It is being largely ignored by the major media and by most of the people of the world. Because it is being ignored, answers are not being found and people are manipulated by this experience. So listen closely. Help us find the answer. Well, it was uh, November 5th, 1975. Uh, there were seven of us, a group of men, working in the forest, uh, cutting trees. Um, we just finished a long, hard day's work, and uh, we were at the time of the home, and it, it started to get dark. Uh, we loaded our chainsaws into the truck. We were uh, riding in a crew cab truck, a double cab truck, which is how seven people were not uh, able to fit into uh, one vehicle. And we headed home. 
And as we were leaving the area, we noticed a light coming through the trees. There was something uh, strange about this light right off. It was just out of place, you know. The, the woods are a very uniform environment, and, you know, there's, you don't see these kind of things. But uh, the, the glow was coming from uh, our right, uh, up towards the top of the ridge. Uh, the road we were on was headed up the ridge towards the rim road, and uh, there was uh, thick trees between us and the source of this light, but we could see this light coming through there, and there was just something really weird about it from, from the start. You know, everybody had been kind of chattering, carrying on, and uh, talking, and uh, although nobody said, hey, look at that, right, up, right off, you know, one by one, everybody kind of fell silent and was looking off to the same direction I was looking. So I figured that, you know, they, were, they saw it too uh, at that point. And uh, as we... Uh, Drove. I was trying to, you know, figure out what this could be. I thought it might be a, some hunters camp there, maybe a forest fire or something. Maybe, maybe a, a crashed airplane hanging up in the tree. But uh, when we finally got around those trees, where we could get a straight shot back up through there to see the source of this light, we saw it hovering there, and uh, we saw a uh, large, glowing, disc-shaped object hovering uh, in the sky, and uh, it was unmistakable. After that, one of the guys in the back yelled out, it's a spaceship. And the boss slammed on the brakes, stopped the truck. Um, this is this, what we saw was not uh, some little point of light off in the sky. It was not some uh, glowing ball of gas or anything like that. It was, it was distinctly visible. It was definite, clear outline, mechanical edges. Uh, it was uh, a glowing uh, metallic object. It was the color of uh, molten metal coming out of a blast furnace. It's kind of a, a golden white color. It just lit up the, the area with a strange sort of a glow. Now, Travis, this is kind of important. Did the did the skin of this object that you saw actually glow, or was this glow around it, or was it a product of a whole bunch of lights? Well, could could well, you discern that? There were darker areas or dividing parts to it, but there was actually light coming from the crack. It was not so bright that you couldn't look at it, but there were actually appeared to be the surface of the craft was lit up. Mm -hmm. There was a strange sort of a glow that was kind of like there and not there. It just kind of put a strange color to everything in the, in the, in the area. But uh, seeing this thing, um, I thought, you know, kind of like when you spot a wild animal in the woods, you know, you're just going to catch a glimpse and it'll be gone. And so I, I thought that I uh, missed a chance to see this thing up close and and so I got out of the truck and started towards this thing. Uh, all the guys started yelling at me to get away from there and get back in the truck. It was causing them a lot of uh, anxiety. And, you know, I was I was pretty scared too. But uh, I guess I was grandstanding a little bit for them. At the same time, I, I was curious. I wanted to see this thing up close. So... Uh, as I went towards it, I, I could hear this uh, strange sound that it was making. It was a sound, you know, unlike anything I've ever heard before or since. It was a very odd mixture of sounds. There was some a, kind of a low rumble to it, a kind of a rhythmic pounding that seemed to vibrate uh, the ground in my body. It was something that you could more like you could feels and hear, but there were also some high uh, notes in there that were intermittent. The, the thing kind of was a kind of a whine to it, like a turbine generator or something. Anyway, 
it, it wasn't really loud. It was just kind of a, it was just a sound that was there. Was this a mechanical sound, like machinery? It, it did sound, there were some machinery sounds too, but there were some other tones there that were just... Uh, Things you didn't recognize. Yeah, something that I just hadn't heard before. Kind of like, you know, it kind of gives you the feeling that you're hearing something that's kind of going off of the frequency range of your hearing now. But, um... As I got towards, uh, closer to this thing, I, I slowed down because I was feeling, you know, a little bit more apprehension the closer I got to it because it didn't take off um, immediately. Well, but when I got closer to it, it did uh, suddenly start to move, uh, and uh, the sound, there was a swell, a powerful swell in the sound that startled me. And I, I jumped for cover behind a, uh, a log that was sticking up out, out of a, a logging slash pile there. I jumped down behind the end of this log, and, and uh, you know, result, I, I was going to get the hell out of there because, you know, I was in danger. I raised up, and I felt uh, uh, an electric shock, kind of a numbing, like, it was almost like a physical blow to my upper body that uh, uh, caused me to lose consciousness. I just blacked out. Uh, from that moment on, I, I, you know, I was out. But uh, the men in the truck said that they saw a, a brilliant bolt of energy. They said it was kind of blue-green in color. Uh, come out of the bottom of the craft, uh, hit me in the upper body, head and chest area. And uh, they said when it when it hit me that it made a sound, sort of a kind of a whoop kind of a sound, a, uh, a popping sound, like a like a, a giant spark or something. But uh, mm -hmm. they said it looked like an explosion. They said it looked like a grenade had gone off in front of me. And you don't remember this? No, I I don't remember this. This is just based on their descriptions. Uh, and some of those descriptions kind of vary. One of the guys in the original police report I just got a hold of recently described it as a long blue flame, you know, and uh, some of them described it kind of like a lightning bolt or, or like a laser beam or something. But anyway, uh, they said that, uh, that when it first hit me that it kind of stiffened me out and they said it threw me back through the air and they said when I, my body hit the ground that I hit just as limp, limp like a rag doll. And they saw the dust boiling up around me, and they thought I'd been fried. You know, they uh, just immediately panicked and uh, fled the scene. Um, well, there's been a lot of criticism uh, directed at the men for for leaving at that point. Everyone imagines that in such circumstances they would uh, be more heroic and stand their ground. But uh, I think it's an unfair judgment. You know, people that think they might react one way might be surprised when they're, when they're actually confronted with the situation. Truth is, no one really knows until it happens to them personally. And everybody probably would react in a different way. It's unfair, uh, in my estimation, uh, to judge that kind of... Uh, thing without being there. It's not subjective. But uh, go ahead, continue. Well, you know, this, this issue of, of bravery or cowardice there is, is something that came up a lot. And uh, the crew boss, who was my, my best friend, uh, got a lot of flack over, uh, over there. You know, these people in the media would come and um, interview him. And one of the first questions was, how could you, how could you go off and leave your friend there? And uh, you know, I think that uh, he kind of projected this onto me, you know, he was having a big load of guilt dumped on him, and he kind of felt that I felt that way. Did, did he feel that you had originally raised this question? I think he did, you know, and part of the problem between he and I that uh, resulted in a falling out that lasted several years was, was that my brother uh, took great exception to this, you know, uh, especially while I was missing, you know, asking him, you know, how he could, how he could possibly uh, leave his brother, you know. So, it, it led to some problems, but, you know, I, I have to say that these guys 
were in a position where they couldn't have done anything else. They were uh, facing an unknown threat, and you know, they had no weapons, they had no way of uh, dealing with this. You know, uh, they could have uh, found themselves in a similar situation uh, uh, falling to similar faces many if they had tried to, to, to do anything about it. So, um, they, they drove away uh, in panic, and uh, I was told that, uh, you know, all the men were, were screaming at, at uh, Mike to keep going and get, on, get him out of there. But they, they, they said they drove up a quarter of a mile and, you know, had a very agitated discussion as to what to do. And they, they stopped the truck and, and, and hashed it out. And uh, a lot of the men, you know, were, were saying, let's just, let's just get out of here and get some help. And uh, they, a truck went by at that time, or there were some hunters, deer hunters. It was deer season at the time. So they took off and tried to catch the truck. Uh, and... Uh, were not one able, one were unable to catch up with them. So um, they said they uh, decided that they had to go back. Uh, not everybody was in agreement with that, uh, but the boss and a couple of the other guys in the truck that you know were feeling more responsible about the situation insisted. There was some argument there about whether they would. You know, the ones that didn't want to go would just get out of the truck and stay there and wait for the others to go uh, get help. But they were too scared to do that, so they all went back. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because uh, this is a departure that the movie takes from what actually happened. In the movie, they show uh, Mike going back alone, whereas they all went back. And as they approached the area, they saw the craft rise up and uh, the streak off towards the northeast. So they felt fairly uh, secure in returning to the spot. The northeast is the Port Corners area. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> anyway. That's, they, that's, that's very important. But go ahead. Uh, they were extremely terrified uh, when they got there, and uh, they got a flashlight out, and they said they... Uh, went around the area uh, they, 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 they found my tracks where I got out of the truck and led up to the spot where I'd been hit and they couldn't find tracks going anywhere else but they made a search the area calling out and uh, when they couldn't find me they decided they had to go report it uh, some of the guys were saying let's just get some more help from you know the friends and family and get out there and see if maybe he did just wander off but uh, it was finally decided that they'd have to report it to the authorities. Now, all this that you're telling us now is not your own memory or no, your own account. No. This is accounts that you've been told since this, you returned. This is what we've been reporting in the second mm -hmm. and some of the reports and things that I've read. After this beam of light or energy or whatever it was hit you, you don't really remember anything for quite some time. Do you? Right. Okay. When, when they uh, got back to town, they... Um, called the um, local deputy and uh, he came and uh, interviewed them and uh, and he radioed his boss the, the, the sheriff in the county seat who came there was he still do they still work for the sheriff's department uh, some of them uh, well uh, the sheriff is now a county supervisor okay. and uh, his under sheriff is now driving a propane truck a and uh, <coughs> uh, I think the, the another one uh, is in law enforcement someplace else the original deputy that took the report but um, anyway uh, the, the sheriff remarked that when he finally did uh, uh, arrive there and this was almost two hours later that uh, some of the men were still crying that they ex looked uh, extremely distraught and upset but the uh, sheriff and his men uh, you know although they could tell something really terrible had happened immediately suspected that there had been foul play and that there had been a fight or something and uh, maybe the men had uh, killed me chainsaws or something and uh, that uh, they had buried my body hidden my body out there and just made up the story to cover up for the deed. So, um, the, uh, 
the sheriff organized a massive manhunt of the area that uh, spanned four days using helicopters, uh, six-winged aircraft, uh, men on horseback. There were 50 men out there. And uh, they were uh, looking for a body. Uh, and uh, they, they failed to find a body, but there was still this accusation of murder. So uh, men requested uh, the volunteer for polygraph tests. The sheriff brought in uh, their top examiner uh, from the uh, state police, uh, Department of Public Safety, Doug Gilson, who tested the six men, and uh, they passed. It was originally announced that five passed and one was inconclusive, that they couldn't tell it either way. But I uh, recently got a hold of the original police report, and it was privately uh, told to the sheriff that uh, the six men had been telling the truth, too. But since he'd become upset with the examiner and walked out to before he had to speak, that he had to give it an official inconclusive. But nevertheless, uh, this sort of puts to rest uh, in some people's minds the idea um, that I'd been murdered. But uh, I, I think a lot of people weren't completely convinced until uh, I turned up uh, five days and six hours after. Uh, I've been taken. Where did all this take place, Travis? Um, well, the um, the incident happened uh, near the Rim Road in the Apache City Ridge National Forest. Is that the name of the road? I mean, if somebody were to go look for it, would they look for the Rim Road? Well, the Rim Road stretches all the way across the forest. It, it, it's um, it's near it's near Turkey Springs. Okay. Turkey Springs is the uh, was the name of the contract that we were working on, and it actually uh, actually happened on the contract. Uh, we hadn't completely left the area before it happened. Anyway, um, the first thing I recall uh, after losing consciousness was I was lying on my back. I was in a tremendous amount of pain. I, I didn't come to real quickly either. I just kind of went in and out. Uh, now, by pain, Travis, what do you mean? Do your arms hurt? Your legs hurt? Well, you got any broken know, bones? It kind of centered in my head and chest, but it seemed like it was all over. It was just this ache or burning feeling all over me. Um, I, there was a light above me, and I could hear people moving around me. And I remembered at one point there that approaching this thing and, and something hitting me. But uh, so I, I assumed that I had been hurt and taken to a hospital. And it wasn't until I finally could focus my eyes and see that I saw these creatures standing over me. And I and I just I just became a sort I just flipped out. You know, by creatures, that this you did remember this that you, uh, yes. you you came to slowly. You had this pain that centered in your head and chest area, and you saw what you described as creatures. Could you be more specific? What did they? What did these things creatures well, look like? They were humanoid. By that I mean they had two arms and two legs, hands, you know, and like that. But they were they were small, uh, a little over four feet tall. Uh, hairless. They had very large head, hairless heads. They were a, a kind of a chalky grayish white color. And they, they had small features, like small nose, mouth, and ears, except their eyes. Did they actually have a nose and have ears? Yes, they did. Um, and, uh, what was it about the eyes? That the eyes, the eyes were huge. You know, there was these huge eyes. Uh, they just seemed to to look right to me. They just had this strange feeling when they looked at me. There was a kind of an um, impersonal quality there, just a kind of a coldness. Of... There was also a feeling of uh, of great intelligence. You know, just. You know, in dealing with people, when you look at somebody, you, you kind of look into their eyes, and for some reason, you can always 
gauge, barely accurately, of a person's level of intelligence is by looking in their eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got the feeling of, of, an, of a very high level of intelligence, but at, at the same time, they seemed to be completely indifferent to my hysteria. I was screaming, I just was hysterical. And there must have been some other quality about them that caused you to, to feel... Uh, whatever it was that caused you to go into hysterics, as you described it. I'm trying to, well, to use your words so that I don't put anything you know, on this that they not They try to picture this, well, you know, I see ten foot jelly masses, you know. They, they, you know they, 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 they see these things on TV uh, or theater or movies, you know, the special uh -huh. effects get so wild, these horrible creatures. They think, what's so horrible about that? If you see something in real life that is human but not human in that way it's just you know you just can't imagine that the situation confronting this in reality it's, it's, I think a lot of that in retrospect is, is the fact that when I came to I was in such pain I, you know I'm combining the shock of the sight of these things with this pain that I was feeling plus the feeling of, of being trapped did you equate the two in other words did you feel that the pain was a was, uh, was just kind of an instant it was just kind of a reaction were you afraid Travis I was terrified I, I, it was you know it's hard for me to even talk about it uh, I was missing for over five days and six hours and yet I can only recall just a matter of minutes of that time and most of that was just I was in a state of total terror total hysteria uh, until I was finally forced down onto a table they put a mask over my face it was a looked like a an oxygen mask and I didn't have any tubes up there it was a black ball did it cover your whole face or just your mouth? Or? Just my mouth and nose. And uh, I reached up and tried to pull it away, but before I could, I, I blacked out. And that was the last thing I remembered until I found myself lying face down beside the road outside of Heber. We've got to take our break now, folks. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this very short pause. Hello, folks. This is William Cooper. I know that some of you are aware of this, but many of you may not be. We have a partner in our efforts, and that partner's name is Swiss America Trade. They stuck by us through thick and thin. You know, most sponsors would not. However, these are people who believe in our mission, so to speak. They believe in what we're doing. They believe in the purpose of the hour of the time. They believe that this show is important. So they pay for the airtime. All they ask in return, folks, is that when you get ready, and you should be ready by now, when you get ready to take steps to protect your assets, to protect all that you've worked for all of your life, the sum total of all of the material possessions that you have, that you give them a call. Their number is 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. 289-2646. Now, that's not much to ask, folks, especially when you're going to get several things back in return that don't cost you a penny. For the first 200 callers, for example, tonight you'll get uh, Harry Piggy's book, Tackle the Debt. Actually, it's a, uh, it's a small uh, report is what it is. And if you mention my name, William Cooper, you'll also get a free newsletter on protecting your future. Now they have many different kinds of investments at Swiss America Trading, some that they're going to recommend to you right off the bat because they believe in those um, investments. They have some that uh, we've recommended on this program. They have some that we don't know anything about and thus can't recommend or not recommend. And they have some that we don't recommend. But that's up to you to decide what you're going to do with your money. I can tell you this, people who call Swiss America Trading when they first began to sponsor this program have already realized a substantial, a substantial increase in their investment. They have called me and have thanked me for turning them on to Swiss America Trading. Why don't you do the same, folks? It's a, an 800 number. It doesn't cost you a thing to make the call. You'll get Harry Piggy's report called Tackle the Debt. You'll also get a free newsletter if you mention my name, William Cooper, on protecting your future. And by protecting your future, folks, you'll be 
ensuring the protection of the future of this radio show, The Hour of the Time, in freedom for the world. So call right now, 1-800-289-2646. Don't procrastinate. Do it now. 1-800-289-2646. You'll be glad that you did. thing I remembered until I found myself lying face down beside the road outside of Heber. And that's the town nearest where this happened. Um, I remembered at that point what had happened to me. But I got, as I raised my head up, I could see a light shining down onto the roadway there. And I looked up just as the light went off, and uh, I couldn't see whether it was a hatch closing or a light on the outside of this thing going off, but I saw this this disc-shaped craft, and this was different from the one we saw in the woods. This was more rounded looking and uh, more polished, it's sort of a silvery look to it. Was this daylight or night? It was night, and just as I looked, it shot straight up into the sky, very quick. And it's surprising it would be silent as quickly as it moves. It just kind of stirred the air a little bit. Uh, I felt heat coming from it, but it wasn't getting off light. And I looked around, recognized this piece of road, and I saw lights down there, and I ran down into the town. I managed to call my family to, to come and get me before I collapsed there in the phone booth where they found me. And this was just outside Heaver? Yeah. Did anybody else uh, come along and talk to you during this time? Well, it, it was desolate. There was no one. Mm -hmm. But when you uh, woke up there after five days and six hours, were you clean shaven? Were you? Did you need a bath? Yeah, were your clothes dirty? I didn't realize this, but you know, when they picked me up and they were taking me back, I, I was I was pretty hysterical, and they made references to uh, people worrying in the church and stuff, and. Up until that point, I thought this was the same night. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they said, that, Travis, it's been five days. And that was just such a, a shock to me, you know. I just, they said, feel your face. And, I, you know, I had five days growth of beard. And I just kind of lapsed into a sort of a state of... Uh, Catatonia there. Did it appear like you'd been taken care of while you were gone? And well, were, was your was your body clean? Or? The physician that examined me the next day was did remark that I was not in the condition of someone who had been wandering around the woods for five days. Uh -huh. uh, that I was relatively clean, except for you know sawdust from working out there. 
and uh, there were a number of tests that were run, medical tests, a whole battery of tests, uh, because, you know, the main thing was I was, I was worried that there was some lingering effects here, you know. Was I going to come down with some bizarre infection that nobody had any answer for? Was, you know, were there going to be uh, harmful effects from breathing an atmosphere that wasn't right for me? You know, would I, you know, did I have been exposed to radiation? But the tests uh, <clears throat> came out, you know, pretty clean on that point. And, uh, Right off the bat, when this happened, you know, once once the men had resolved the question of murder by Tennyson polygraph test, uh, <clears throat> there was the accusation that, well, <clears throat> they just believed this happened to them. They were all out there drunk or on drugs or something, and they hallucinated this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the medical tests was that um, I had blood and urine samples uh, run to the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's drug screen, which revealed no trace of any drugs. And, you know, in the aftermath of this, it, it, there was an incredible amount of effort directed at trying to explain it away any way people could. It was just one allegation after another, and it got to be pretty ridiculous. Um, did this cause you a lot of problems in your personal life? It, it really did. And, you know, as years went on and this continued, then people's reaction to it was so severe that I have to say that looking back on it, a lot, a major portion of the, of the unpleasantness in the, in, in the whole retrospect of this thing is people's reaction to it to the point where, you know, it almost overshadows the, the event itself. And that's saying a lot. That is saying a lot. Uh, in fact, that's saying a, a hell of a lot. Uh, did you have any support group? Did you belong to a church? Did you have, uh, did your family stand behind you? Well, uh, the people who knew me best were the people who were the most supportive. The people who attacked the most, the people who ha uh, said the most disparaging things, and the people who knew me the least and really knew the least about the event itself. They uh, really didn't have the facts, and so many of the theories that were advanced to try to explain it away were at complete odds with basic, easily verified facts. Mm -hmm. It's just one thing after another, you know. If it wasn't a, a drug hallucination, then it was a transitory psychosis. I suddenly flipped out and hallucinated the whole thing. But both of those theories fail to take into consideration that seven people do not have identical hallucinations. We all saw the same thing. So, <clears throat> there was uh, naturally a uh, um, you know, I, I took polygraph tests myself. I've uh, taken and passed three separate polygraph tests mm -hmm. and uh, I've undergone regressive hypnosis. And there's a lot of uh, physical evidence that's been ignored in this case. Tell us about some of the physical evidence that uh, we all know that physical evidence is something hard. We can feel, we can see, we can smell, we can taste, uh, we can hold in our hands. Uh, what was it and what happened to it? Well, there was a, a researcher uh, in the area, in the Kagi area right after this happened. And uh, he went to the site and he found uh, traces of ozone, high, uh, high, high levels of ozone in the area. Uh, and I'm not real familiar with how he, what machinery he used to, to take that. Uh, how, how many days after the event was this? This was... Uh, I don't know. It's a couple of days. And who who was this this researcher? He's a Bill Spalding from a, a Brown Saucer Walsh. Okay. He also uh, had a Gauss meter. Uh, um, that he took a magnetic reading. He, he plotted the area out on a grid map and uh, found some incredible magnetic anomalies. Uh, I guess in the surrounding area that it, you have a uniform uh, reading, whereas right at the site where the craft uh, appeared, 
there was uh, some um, the high readings, like 10 or 12 plus and uh, minus up to a 15 uh, in, in one spot there. Uh, um, Goss, for, uh, deviation from background. Um, also, there was a man that came to the site. Uh, I was told about this uh, during the search. Uh, a couple of the men on the crew were present. The man was dressed in a Forest Service uniform. Now, the, the, the crew boss is familiar with all the Forest Service guys in the area, so unless he was from outside the area, uh, anyway, this, this guy was kind of mysterious in his behavior because he was taking these readings around the area, and when the men approached him, um, he seemed to be extremely um, vague about what he was doing. Um, they, they tested, uh, he said, well, test us. And so they tested the man, and it was just background, uh, really the one and a half. And I said, well, okay, we've, uh, we've uh, gone home, changed our clothes, and uh, and invade. So uh, how about testing our hard hats? And so uh, the guy said, okay, and they went and got the hard hats, and, uh, and uh, the uh, hard hats registered six on the dial. And uh, this was twice that of a guy's radium dial watch there. And uh, the, uh, the, the man reacted very strangely to this, and uh, when the man said, well, test the truck, you know, that was here, you know, um, he rolled his equipment up and uh, walked away, and uh, then there was time again. And there was everything reported about these readings, but there were, you know, a number of witnesses. And nobody really knows who this guy was. No, not, uh, it, it may have been somebody that the Forest Service brought out, but it may have been some uh, government man uh, in disguise, I, I don't know. But, uh, Okay, they had those uh, magnetic readings, ozone, the uh, radiation. There were also a number of fragments found by Mr. Spaulding at the site. He said that uh, they were uh, small little chips of what looked like, they were shiny gray sort of, uh, looked like obsidian. It very, very definitely looked to be like an unnatural material. And obsidian, for our listeners, is a volcanic glass. Yeah. Anyway, there's no kind of mineral like that in this in the area. But uh, he found a, a pile of these uh, metal fragments uh, that he uh, um, turned over to uh, my brother, who turned that over to the people from the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization who had it analyzed, uh, and they said that it uh, was some sort of a high-temperature, high-grade silicon. Uh, but, you know, that's all pretty mysterious, and, I, and the samples have uh, disappeared. I don't have any written report on that. You know, that nobody uh, disadmits, and it, there's been material written about it here and there, but nothing real official. It's really kind of a loose end that... Uh, I think really should have been followed up on. Now, people used to hear a lot of talk about this, but nobody really, uh, as far as my uh, investigation into this, is concerned, nobody really started to do any any real research into what happened there, and nobody seemed to be interested uh, in a big way, such as the movie that was made, until just in the last few years. Why is that, Trevor? Well, you know, I got kind of disgusted with all the controversy and all the untrue things that were being said. There were things published that were just one inflated thing after another, just stacked upon and stacked upon. In order to refute that, you just, you know, I, I first started to try to do that. I'd get out there and try to rebut these things. I'd, Look, I can prove this isn't true. And I would document it, but it was just one thing after another. I just got disgusted with it. Well, this, this is the way that the uh, ufology movement seems to operate. They're, they're, they're not professional. Anybody can call themselves a and uh, they tend to do that kind of thing, which is why uh, we, we, as an organization, separated ourselves from them totally also, uh, because there's so much rampant uh, total bullshit.
relationship connected with those people that it, it doesn't even pay to get involved with him. But um, there are some people who are seriously trying to uncover the truth of what's happening. There are several different scenarios that could be occurring. One, of course, is the possible visitation of this planet by extraterrestrials. Another is uh, that this could be a human technology and, and what people perceive to as happened may have been uh, put into their minds by some sophisticated mind control operation. None of us really know. We're really trying to get to the bottom of this because whatever it is, it certainly means something profound for our future. There's I no agree. Doubt about I agree. And, you know, and as far as all those theories concern, are concerned, even though this happened to me, you know, any one of those could explain it. I, I, I lean towards uh, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, but I do not exclude the idea that this could be some manifestation of some Earth uh, power uh, at all. It, it's, uh, it's, it's very possible. How has this affected you through the years, Travis? Uh, do people uh, still remember this? Do you still have problems in your personal life with this? I know that I notice you still live in the same town, which must have caused you a tremendous uh, yeah. uh, amount of trouble. You know, there was a lot of stigma and all the controversy and everything, so you know, I just kind of slammed the door on it and just refused to talk about it for so long. And, and uh, you know, I had a lot of movie offers over the years, and I turned those down because I was just fed up with it. And so, you know, that's really why it's, it's so long before this the movie happens. And uh, the, the way they persuaded me to do this was, that, you know, the idea was if they could create something that would uh, allow people to live for themselves, you know, what we've been through, you know, experience it on, on the gut level, you know, the, the emotional experience that maybe it would open up their minds and they'd take a more objective look at the other and you know the movie's not a documentary but as far as on the emotional the experiential level I think it did succeed in doing that because I had noticed a profound change in people's attitudes in the community and, and in terms of their reaction to me just since they've seen the movie? Yeah, I think the movie had that effect. Now, I've heard all kinds of things about the movie. I haven't seen it yet. I intend to see it this weekend because it's on the drive in uh, over in the Pine Top Lakeside area while we're up here. Uh, we're going to go see it. I didn't want to see it until I talked to you simply because I heard so much about the movie deviating from your real story. And I didn't want that to color this uh, interview at all. We try to uh, keep anything extraneous to what... Uh, to what uh, should come out in an interview, which we always hope is the truth, uh, from interfering. Uh, if there were anything that you could do different, what would you have done? Uh, concerning the experience, mm -hmm. one thing: stay in the truck. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have never let this thing have never happened if I'd have known what was going to come out of it. It seems that people who do stay in their vehicles and do stay in their trucks and don't try to approach these things when they have these types of encounters uh, never have these kinds of problems on the norm. I mean, there are some exceptions to this, but on the norm. And it, it, uh, on, the, uh, on the other side, it does appear that people who do get out of their cars or trucks or do try to approach these things do have uh, on the norm the same kind of experience or experiences like the one that you had, mm -hmm. uh, which tends to tell me that if you ever have an experience with an unidentified flying object at a close range, uh, stay away from it. Don't yeah. try to approach it. And that would be my recommendation, too, because I don't think we know enough about what's going on to say whether it's uh, dangerous or not. You know, I, I personally, in hindsight, can say, hey, they did return me and I'm alive, but who, who could fathom what their purposes were, you know, whether that was. Uh, done out of some moral obligation or maybe some other reason they had uh, I can't say so I would say stay away from it now, I don't want to open a can of worms with this next question but I have to ask this they return you, did they return anything else with you, have you noticed uh, that you're smarter, are you healthier are uh, strange ideas come into your mind or uh, 
or, or maybe you're not as smart. I don't know. Uh, and you may not even want to ask, answer this because it might cause a whole new controversy. But right. who wants to get that? <laughs> but these are the things that come to mind. Uh, why did they take you? Do you do you have any idea? I mean, if they didn't leave anything with you, what was the whole point? I don't know. I don't know. You know, a lot of people, you know, news media refer to it real glibly as a as a medical examination. You know, I don't know what they were doing to me. I woke up in the middle of whatever was going on, and and uh, who can who can know? You know, and it, it it's terrifying to speculate about that. And I really just kind of put it out of my mind. But uh, I don't know what the purpose was. You can drive yourself and not trying to figure it out because what happened to me, you know, so much seems to be a fragment. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just not enough to go on there. Did you have any set religious viewpoints before this happened to you? Were yeah. you a member of a church? Yeah, I was a member of the, the church here. And, uh, which, which church were you a member of? Uh, LDS Church. Uh, Latter day Saints? Yes. Yeah. Uh, have, have your religious views changed since this happened? No, and I, I really don't think that this necessarily has any religious implications unless your religion specifically denies such things. But, you know, I think that uh, the supreme being, uh, beings uh, uh, are uh, over everything there is, and this is just one of things, the things it is. <laughs> did your church support you? Did uh, the people... Uh, I didn't, I didn't, did you feel like you I were really on display when you went to went to church? Yeah, I did, and so I tended to stay away, which is uh, you know people's reaction to this. I, I kind of turned inward and kind of shut shut people out. I, I went it alone. My my main method of coping with all this was denial. So I just sort of slammed the door on it and put it out of my mind. And, you know, it was nothing we would talk about at home and just mm -hmm. try to get on with life and live as normal as possible. And it took a lot of time, a lot of years before, you know, things started to feel anything close to normal. And you don't think that you were left with any message or any, uh, I hope not. any revelations or anything of that kind? Well, you certainly uh, differ from the norm. I meet so many people and uh, talk to them who say that they were given some task to do in the future and they know that they've got this task to do but they don't know what it is and some tell me they have a message to give to humanity and that's what they're trying to do uh, and you know I never make judgments about this I'm trying to find out what this is all about rather than judge the individual people uh, because on the whole on the whole most of the people that I've talked to including you uh, I believe believe uh, the story that they're telling in their heart and in their mind that they believe that what they're telling me happened really happened whether it did or not of course is is a whole different story but that's going to be down the road when we finally solve this mystery and I think it ultimately will be solved but I don't know how that's going to be done yeah. uh, I tell you it's not going to be done by uh, by ignoring it and by ridiculing people who come forward with these stories what it tends to do is people who may have experienced this tend not to come forward and so there may be a wealth of knowledge out there that we can't even get to because of that. What do you think about the movie? How do you feel about that? Well, you know, I would like to urge everyone to realize that the movie is not a documentary. You know, Hollywood does take dramatic license and uh, if, if you're looking for a, doc, a documentary, uh, you know, read my book, you know, with, the, with, with what the movie's based on. Because, you know, there I go into all the specific details about how the movie di differs from the book and all that kind of stuff. But, but um, the movie does succeed in communicating the feeling, the, the core essence of what we experience. And uh, the, the events that surrounded uh, the, the search and the, the accusations of murder and the investigation and all that, all that stuff was very close to the way it really was. So, you know, you can rely on that in there. Whether it happened or not, and neither right. do they. You know, they, they felt that since probably things had happened that I couldn't recall, that they felt justified in, in, in speculating these things. Do you think they speculated, or do you think that maybe they took this from some of the stories oh, that yeah. other abductees have yeah, they come did. forward That's with? what they said, that they took them from some other reports that they had, some of the more unusual ones that they thought would add, uh, you know, visual impact to the story. But another thing that they were doing was a lot of what happened uh, to me were the craft, the things that were going on inside my head. Um, sorts of psychological things, things I was thinking. And since they didn't want to use a narrator, you know, that's, that's tacky, they wanted to be able to show rather than tell. 
they had they contrived scenes that they felt would evoke the same emotion as what I was telling. For instance, there's this scene where uh, the actor is is being held down by this membrane. And you know, when I when I uh, regained consciousness, I found myself in a very cramped space. It was dimly lit. I was having a great deal of difficulty breathing. The air was seeming very humid and, and hard to breathe. And so I had these feelings of uh, claustrophobia and suffocation that would be impossible to translate to film if you just showed um, an actor standing there breathing hard, looking panicked. You know, you wouldn't understand why. But incidentally, that's one of the most terrifying feelings to ever uh, yeah. experience is the feeling of suffocation and, yeah. and not being able to breathe. So, you know, that was another factor concerning that that we discussed earlier about why I reacted so negatively to the side of them. It was this feeling of suffocation. Too. But anyway, there was this scene where the actor is held down by this membrane. He's struggling to, to move. It's covering his face. He's struggling to breathe. And I think that very powerfully evokes the emotions of uh, claustrophobia and suffocation that I was feeling, although there was you know, nothing that I recall that happened just that way. reports, the sheriff report, the report of the special investigator, and those who initially spoke with the logging crew and Travis Walton was that they saw a light in the woods. Just a light. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody had any idea. Travis Walton got out of the truck to go look at this light, and they said they saw a bright flash of light, and Travis Walton went down on the ground. They got scared and left in their truck. That was the story. Travis Walton, when he came back, said that they saw a light in the woods and he wanted to see what it was. And he jumped out of the truck and ran into the woods and he said he saw a bright flash of light and that was it. He said he didn't remember anything until he came to on a road in Heber and he saw a bright light sort of receding in the distance. And that was it. And then later... When questioned, he said, well, he did remember sort of uh, sort of being half awake, half asleep, and having this feeling of suffocation and nothing else. And then a man by the name, ladies and gentlemen, of James Harder used hypnosis. And after that, people began talking about this disc-shaped craft that they saw. And uh, Travis began talking about the fact that he had gone toward a disc-shaped craft, a spacecraft, a um, made out of metal that hummed and made noises, and 
and that uh, when he woke and felt like he was suffocating, he was in the panic hysteria, and he saw these little creatures, which, ladies and gentlemen, what he describes uh, are not extraterrestrials or aliens, and uh, in a state of full-blown panic hysteria, and you feel like you're suffocating and you're scared to death, and you're sort of half in and out of, of being conscious and being unconscious, and it's only for just a few fleeting moments or seconds, as the case may be, he could have gone through a complete state of imagination. Or he could have been lying on a table with people standing around him. I don't know if you've ever looked at a an operating room scene, ladies and gentlemen, but I've been operated on, and I can tell you that when you're lying on an operating table, the table is raised high into the air. When the doctors and nurses stand around it, and you're seeing a completely different perspective than you're used to. Usually people, when they're lying, they're lying on a couch or on the ground or in a bed. And when someone stands beside the bed or stands beside them on the ground or beside the couch, they look in the proper perspective. But if you were to raise that bed high in the air and have someone who's six foot tall standing next to you, they look very short. They look very small. And if you're looking at doctors and nurses who are wearing surgical gloves and gowns and their head is completely covered with masks and, and uh, a covering over their hair, and the only thing that is showing is their eyes. They look like hairless creatures with huge eyes when you are sort of half in and out of the anesthesia. I know because I've seen it. The only thing is I knew I was in an operating room. And I knew they were doctors and I knew they were nurses. And they looked small because the operating table was raised up high. And I never once gave it a thought that anyone could mistake such a scene for extraterrestrial creatures or beings or something else. Um, but I can certainly understand how that could happen. I don't know what happened to Travis Walton. I don't know if Travis Walton knows what happened to Travis Walton. I do know that nobody else knows what happened to Travis Walton. And I do know that his story has changed. Since... Uh, the initial reports given to investigators, it changed in this interview. And since this interview was made back in spring of 1993, it has changed again. It changed last weekend when I saw Travis Walton interviewed on television on uh, one of these shows, I forget, may have been sightings. And uh, it had, you know, he was talking about walking around in the spaceship, watching what these creatures were doing and all kinds of different things. And, uh, and that's what happens with a lot of these stories. I want to take your calls now and see what you have to say about all this. 520-333-4578. is the number. And, uh, now, bear in mind, folks, I'm not telling you that Travis Walton lied. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, my experience with a lot of these people who claim that they have been abducted by whoever has abducted them, whether it happens in their own mind or whether it's something that's really taking place, all appear to me to believe exactly what they're telling me. Many of them do not pass lie detector tests. Travis Walton was given a lie detector test, which he failed miserably. In fact, the man who administered the text, test uh, stated emphatically that he was practicing gross deception. Gross deception. Later, he took another lie detector test and passed it. But you cannot use lie detector tests as proof about anything. You cannot give someone a lie detector test and if they fail it, say that they're not telling the truth. You can't give someone a lie detector test and if they pass it, say that that proves that they're telling the truth. Because a lie detector test can be manipulated. It's not allowed in any court of law 
because people can defeat it. Not only that, but people, it has been proven, ladies and gentlemen, that people who are telling the truth, being absolutely perfectly honest, can flunk a lie detector test, can fail it. And people who are practicing complete and total deception can pass a lie detector test, and that's why they're not allowed in a court of law. So when these people tout lie detector tests, whether they pass it or fail it as proof that these incidents either did or did not occur, that is not proof at all. And anybody who uses a lie detector test uh, to either support or disprove uh, any incident um, it is, is doing themselves and the person involved and everybody else a great disservice for the reasons that I have stated. And uh, failure to submit to a lie detector test is not an indication that someone is not being truthful or that they're hi trying to hide something. It is rather an indication of a very smart person who knows that lie detector tests can be manipulated either way. Or, if you're telling the truth and being perfectly honest, can indicate that you are telling a lie and being perfectly dishonest. No one should ever submit to a lie detector test because they're taking a hell of a chance. <laughs> and I mean a hell of a chance, ladies and gentlemen. If, if you're perfectly truthful and, and telling the truth and, and trying to be honest and, and you agree, you, you submit to the pressure that's applied to you to take a lie detector test and it comes up and says you're a liar, what are you going to do then? Hmm? So lie detector tests are not proof of anything, either for or against anything. Nothing at all. Here's what we know without any doubt, and uh, without going into any of the changes in the story or anything else. We know the seven men riding in a truck, coming back from a day of logging, saw a bright light in the woods. They all agree on that. That story has never changed. They stopped. Travis Walken, Walton got out of the truck, went toward the bright light. They saw another flash of light. Travis Walton fell to the ground. And uh, the men in the truck drove off and left Travis Walton there, who disappeared. Five days later, Travis Walton reappeared. Five days and six hours reappeared in the small town of Heber, in East Central Arizona, near the Rim Country, the Mogollon Rim. That's all that we know about this, that we know is fact. Everything else cannot be proven or disproven in any way, shape, or form. We can show how there has been a change in the story and then escalation of that change toward an extraterrestrial abduction scenario. Is Travis Walton telling the truth? Well, we don't know that. And there's no way to really tell. So let's see what you have to say about all this. Good evening, you're on the air. Well, good evening, Bill. How you doing? Good. Mike from Rochester, New York again. Hello, Mike. Enjoyed your show last night. It was really kind of a giggle. Great. But I know you're a pretty good researcher, Bill, and I was wondering if in your all tenure of doing this type of work, what do you know about ball lightning? Ball lightning? Ball lightning. Uh, all I know is that it's a natural phenomenon, and it normally occurs um, near places where there are lots of water, like swamps, lakes, rivers, that kind of thing. Um, other than that, I don't know a whole lot, neither does anybody else, and it seems to be, according to scientific observation by people who call themselves scientists, some kind of a plasma uh, phenomenon. Um, that's a, a pretty good background. Well, you yourself live up in the mountainous territory, correct? Yes, it's sometimes also called swamp gas. Right. Uh, do you think because of the possible higher altitudes, there's more of a static charge as you go up in altitude? I don't really know, to tell you the truth. Now, he was in a mountainous area, correct, also, right? The town he lived in? Well, this is, uh, 
he wasn't really in a mountainous area, as a matter of fact, although this is a high elevation. Do you think that possibly he was a static discharge of some type and got hit by that and it just knocked him senseless? I have no idea. That is a reasonable and logical explanation, but it is still conjecture. Yeah, well, most of this stuff is for just about all these cases. I've been kind of, uh, I guess you could say, researching them or just keeping up over the past 20 years, and there's really no rhyme or reason to any of them. And the more you read about it, it seems the more confusing the issue gets. And then you, you know, I, what was that name you said, uh, changings or change over people? There's some term you used, uh, you used it for our bell last night. Oh, oh, change agents. Change agents. Yes. And it just seems like, you know, you read this certain author, and then you read somebody else, and I've heard you mention a few times, I've been listening to you for a few years, and it seems like they take you up to a point, and then you come crashing down, somebody else comes up with another theory, and it's just, nobody's in agreement with anything. Well, they're not supposed to be. You see, part of this whole phenomenon is to keep people spinning around, never finding an answer, but always keeping their attention away from everything else and onto these kinds of things uh, so that they, they don't really get involved in doing the research and investigation that they should be doing about things that are really going to matter about their future. So you're just thinking it's a, a red herring, the whole, the whole process. Well, every, every piece of research that I have developed uh, into uh, the so-called extraterrestrial visitation, abductions, the benevolent space brothers and the baddies that want to eat us and suck our blood and all that stuff. <laughs> You're making me laugh again. Points directly to the Central Intelligence Agency and to uh, uh, a, a, an old, old plan, uh, some of which I read to you last night, to create an artificial threat from space in order to bring humanity together in a one-world government. <laughs> 